They tend to, they tend to be more hands-on with their giving, and they give with their hearts as well as their heads. To talk more about the role of women in philanthropy, we are honored to have with us Rohini Nilekani. A journalist, author, and lifelong activist, Rohini has donated over 160 crores towards philanthropy in India. She has set up the Akshara Foundation, Pratham Books, and more recently, Aragyam. Rohini has been an important voice in strategic philanthropy in India, and we're so grateful to have her here. Rohini is joined on stage with Neera Nandi, a co-founder of Dasra. Great, thank you, Radhi. Um, thank you, Rohini. Uh, I think that Rohini's kind of been one of our strongest supporters and really helped us launch the Indian Philanthropy Forum, which was last year in March. And before that, I think philanthropy wasn't a much discussed topic, let alone being able to attract such a great group of individuals like yourselves to spend the day with us. And I think one clear sort of force behind us and us being able to continue this conversation really has been Rohini. And so thank you so much for, for coming again and for really being a voice around uh, philanthropy. We're going to spend sort of the next half an hour with Rohini. And I think we're going to spend the first 10, 15 minutes just hearing from her, her perspective. And one of these perspectives I think we often don't talk about, but perhaps make a number of assumptions around, which is the role of women in philanthropy. And I've actually asked Rohini, and I hope she shares, really her personal story through um, you know, the ups and downs and really how she got to philanthropy. And I think for many of you out there, this might resonate or this, this might not. But I think discussing how women really do play an active role in deciding uh, where the wealth of our country goes into philanthropy and how, I think having Rohini here and share her story, but also how she's been sp supporting this dialogue throughout the year uh, is really great to have. And then we'll move into Q&A um, shortly after. Thank you, Neera. Sarwana, namaskar. I'm very happy to be here. Um, uh, the second time with the Indian Philanthropy Forum is really an honor. I think y'all have been doing fantastic work, even more than I expected for such a young uh, organization. So really congratulations from my heart. So I've been asked to talk on something that's very interesting and I think little discussed in India, and that's the role of women in philanthropy. So I'll try to stick to that. Where's my timekeeper? Because it's, you know, and could go on and on and on. Okay, I need to know when I'm, I have only two minutes left, okay? Uh -huh to spare the audience. So um, first let me say I opened the Economic Times today from the back end, and it said that Indian women are the most stressed in the world. Now which, in, which women here agree with that? <laughs> they said 87% of the women in their survey feel stressed most of the time, and 82% feel they have no time to relax. Now that to me is a really, really shocking kind of thing and we kind of knew this was true but seeing that in black and white and I urge all of you to go and read that survey, you know, made me really think and the cause of that they put very succinctly was that India today is a 21st, econ 21st century economy but with a kind of somewhere between the 19th and 20th century kind of society and the role of women in such a society is, is still very much in the patriarchy frame. And even today in 2011, uh, let, just think, I mean, how much of women's work is invisible, how much of it is either not valued or undervalued, and what kind of economic rights do they still have? I mean, here some of us in this room are among the few women who do have who do have our rights, who do have uh, a very clear sense of how we add value, how we create wealth, visible and invisible, and, and therefore what, what role we can play in society to either share it or give it back. But I think for the largest millions of people in this, women in this country, that is simply not true. And we must keep that, you know, at the very bottom of this discussion as a floor, as a base, to understand that 
you know, women can be philanthropists in many ways, and they can be that not necessarily by uh, giving away money, because it's hard for them to accumulate it in the first place in a society like that. So it's only a few women who become either wealthy by their own wealth creation, so to speak, or because they are wealthy, because they have fam they are inheritors of family wealth, that can be philanthropists in the sense of giving away large amounts of money. But women have played a very, very key role in being philanthropists. And I'd like to bring a bit of that later in the conversation as, of course, what do we mean by philanthropy is, I'm talking about all kinds of philanthropy, giving away your money, giving away your time, giving away your talent, basically to make society better than it is now. Throughout history, that has been the desire of people. Let me do something because something is wrong. My trigger is something is not right in society and we need to create social change together. And I think that is the, that is the starting point of philanthropy. Women have been doing this all the time in extremely difficult conditions. So I'll not go back in time, but say in India, there are in the freedom movement, post the freedom movement, there are many, many notable women, I'll mention them because sometimes we gloss over their role in Indian history. And especially Maharashtrian women, I'm proud to say, uh, there seems to be a bias here, a lot of the women I'm going to talk about are Maharashtrian, but I must mention them because they played seminal roles in moving the political participation of women in our society forward. You know, from the days when Manu said that all women should stay at home and be controlled either by their fathers, their husbands, or their sons, we've come a bit of a ways, but it's, the battles are not yet won. But these are women who moved out of their personal comfort zones and did a lot to make sure that women had more voice in society, and I'll mention them, and please go look them up. Savitri Bhai Phule, of course. Uh, Jyotiba Phule's partner set up the first school for girls, first school in India for girls in 1848. There was Anandi Bai Joshi, who was one of the first woman doctor in India, and who set up something called Care for Women, exactly the name, that's not exactly the name. Then there was Lady Ava Bai Jija Boy, whom I particularly uh, admire because she funded the construction of the Mahim Causeway, which was public infrastructure. I mean, how forward thinking is that? There's Dr. Iravati Karve. Uh, Gandhiji helped to bring a lot of women out into this fold of giving back. And I think many women did come forward. I have to mention Durga Bai Deshmukh, the lawyer, Pandita Ramabai, who set up Sharda Sadan. Now, all these women, con com you know, it was not just giving back. It was a form of political action also. So their social work and their political action was combined. And they are the kind of women on whose shoulders so many of us stand. And we owe them all a debt for getting outside their comfort zones and making it possible for women to participate more fully in Indian society. So uh, because she has asked me to talk about my personal journey, I will say that I really I began as, I would have always been an activist, whether I had become wealthy or not, in some way or the other, I would have been uh, in the field of social action. I'm very sure of it. Um, but as it happened, I came into some wealth uh, through Infosys. Now, I struggled with this. Whose wealth is it anyway? It, was it my wealth? Is it my wealth and can I do whatever I like with it? Can I buy whatever I like? Can I give it away to whomever I like? And it took years for me to come to some comfort with the idea of that wealth. As it happens, when Infosys was set up, I actually put in some real equity, uh, 10,000 rupees to be quite precise. 5,000 of it came to me as a gift from my parents. And 5,000 was my meager savings in Bank of India under the flyover on Pedder Road. And that was put into uh, Infosys in 1980, uh, between 81 and 82, 80, something like that. Now that happens to have uh, become this kind of wealth. But does that mean that I created Infosys? No. Did I make that money? No. And who? then it led me to think, but how does wealth creation happen in society? We call this a Taj Hotel. But is it a Taj? I mean, sorry, we call this a Tata Hotel, right? The Taj Hotel is a Tata property. But is it, is it the Tatas who made this whole thing happen? How many thousands of people worked to make this hotel be this wonderful place that it is today? Think of any institution in society. Can we say that it was the Amba 
Ambani's or the Murti's or the Nilekani's or the Tata's or anybody else really created that wealth? Of course not. It is a complete social venture. Many things to need to be in place before a, a, an innovator, an entrepreneur can create new value. It comes from what exists. So that was the first thing that I had to struggle with. The second thing I had to struggle with was how much of that is invisible? So the kind of work that some of us did for Infosys, in a narrow way I went through that. We were chauffeurs and cooks and supporters of our husband, uh, husbands, mostly there were men there in Infosys. All those things were there to be counted. Or was it just that I had invested in, in Infosys my 10,000 rupees? What if I hadn't? What if I hadn't put a single paisa in, into Infosys of my so-called earned money? Would that still allow me to share that wealth and say this is my wealth and I can give it away? And I felt then that it is important for us to think through these things. After all, that wealth doesn't belong to Nandan or to me particularly. It has to belong to all of society. And that was that whole thing. I'm glad Noshir brought up the Artha Shastra. Yes, you create wealth. Yes, keep some of it for yourself. Yes, you receive wealth. Keep some of it for yourself, but don't block the flow. Don't make such a stock for yourself, a little dam on that flow of river. You know, that the flows below are not continuing. So then I felt, all right, so that question got over. And then only after solving all these things, I say, anyway, I'm a trustee of this wealth. In any case, this is neither Nandan's wealth nor mine. We are holding it for a while. We are holding some of it very closely and buying this nice sari and these earrings. But a lot of it must go forward. And I became more comfortable about it after that. And then, of course, the great exciting adventure anyway is to figure out how to give it away. Because you cannot live in a society like India's. It's just ridiculous. You cannot live happily in a society like ours, where we are not sure whether 400 million people are going to go to bed with all the nutrition they require for the day. And the next session is going to be about that. So I think that uh, is something. The great adventure is to say, how can we change this? And in that process, we will have to think about how will we change the accumulation of wealth in the first place. My friend Rajni Bakshi was here, and I have million conversations in the year on these kinds of things. A lot of wealth today gets concentrated in the hands of people like me is because we we, we allow certain intellectual property rights to accumulate to people and individuals and corporations. What if it was not like that? In the old days, when the Ajanta and Ilora caves were made, or when such beautiful things were b built and created in this country, uh, were they done? How were they done? They were done all in open source creation, a lot of it. What if that sort of culture came back in this 21st century when we are tackling so many unprecedented problems which require collective action. Then if it was much more in a collaborative open source kind of mo model, value creation going forward, then how wealth is created itself might change. And I think women can play a role in, 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 in sort of bringing these issues to the fore. I have five minutes left. I will come to what I was also asked to say. Uh, what is the role of women in giving today and in the future in India? I think that uh, Indian women are coming into their own. They are becoming official wealth creators. I can think of so many women, notably my friend Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, for example, and so many others like her. And I think they will substantially change the way uh, women will give in this uh, country going forward. Um, I think women in philanthropy will play a bigger and bigger role. And let us see, will women give differently? Will the feminine energy of women and men come more to the fore? Because it's, I think, a much more nurturing energy. Will that define Indian philanthropy? Because we talked a lot about impact. We can discuss that at some other time. But I think those, the way women give will also change the field of philanthropy in India. I think they will hopefully go more to root causes and real social issues like what is the role of women? And in the last three minutes, I'll also say it's not only the rich women who are going to be giving in India. Already, women of all levels have been giving in many ways, and they're going to do more structured giving. For me, the biggest example of that is the formation of self-help groups as a poor people's institution in this country. Just think about it. Over the last 25 years, something like 5 million self-help groups have been formed, each with 10 to 15 women as members in that. Therefore, we have anywhere between 50 and 70 million women of, of, of a 
lower to middle economic strata in this country who have not all those groups are good and functioning, but so many of them are. And all of them now have a platform for collecting.